honestly as I know how Broken by the days gone by Spirit help my soul to rise Say that it's impossible 
Thank you, Worship Collective. You know, this has been an exciting week for me. I've had the opportunity to meet many of you, and I see your excitement about being here at Liberty University. That makes me excited. Now, I was excited last Saturday, too, because our football team won. Now we're three and zero. Now, unfortunately, uh, we're not able to fill that stadium like we normally do because of COVID. But I want to suggest that you maybe get three or four people together in your room or in the community area there and watch it by television. And you can get excited. You can cheer when uh, we make a touchdown. And there you can do something else that probably you shouldn't do in the stands. When the referees make a bad call, you could just tear them apart if you're two or three around. And, but you probably shouldn't do that. Uh, in the stadium because Christians probably shouldn't act that way. But, uh, you know, sometimes these referees just make bad calls. And it seems like it's always bad calls against our team. Maybe we're prejudiced in that area. But we're looking forward to another win this coming Saturday. And I hope that you'll be watching the television or you'll be there. And uh, we're looking forward to an exciting time. Thank you again for the warm welcome that I'm receiving here at Liberty University. And I'm always glad to talk to you. Don't, don't hesitate to come up to me when you see me. And we would enjoy talking with you. Now... Pastor David's going to come and introduce today's speaker. It's such a pleasure to have uh, Liberty's own Gabe Lyons with us. Thanks for coming and being a part of this convocation with us, Gabe. It's always great to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, when I say Liberty Zone, you actually go even further back. You're from this very city. So you you yes. aren't just a Liberty student, but you also went to I went LCA. To LCA. Hey. Yeah, Liberty Christian Academy. Yeah, man. Kindergarten through. I did the whole entire Lynchburg slash Liberty system until I graduated in 20, at 22. And what an incredible place to grow up. Yeah. You know, I had a brother, but my parents, they didn't make a lot of money, but they put a lot of their money into investing in us having a Christian education. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful. So yeah, I have, I have the early days of being a part of Thomas Road Baptist Church when Jerry Falwell Sr. was our pastor. And the other location. And the other location yeah. and Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Awana, like the whole thing. Really? And that was all here. So whenever I come back to Liberty, it's not yeah. just coming to Liberty, it's coming home. And, yeah. and I've really loved just watching how Liberty has grown and just getting to see all that God's doing here has just been awesome. So before we get into your Liberty years, when you were at LCA, you were the starting quarterback. I did. I played a little football and we won a state championship. So yeah. I'm, I'm proud of that because it was the first one that LCA had won at that point in its uh, history. And now I think it's won many more. But yeah, our founder. Scores. Founder offered you a, a ride to come be on the football yep. team here? I got to come, not on the football team, but I got, I got to come to Liberty on scholarship, okay. which was just amazing, yeah. and chose not to walk on and try football. I, I love the social life here. In fact, I met my wife, Rebecca, here. Yeah. And man, made just best friends for life. David and Jason Benham, a couple mm -hmm. guys who I know are still involved here, oh, yeah. uh, became some of our best friends. So there's so many of us that are still in touch today. I mean, yeah whatever, 23 years later from when we graduated that still have these tight bonds of friendship. Right. And it was all forged here on this campus. Yeah. So it's, it's a beautiful thing. So quick thought, I mean, as obviously our student body's watching right now, uh, and even our live audience is just full of students, they're gonna meet friends yeah. their freshman year, like on the hall with them. They're gonna meet people that are gonna be that's right. Lifers with them. That's right. I mean, you're, you, you build community by working together. And I think, especially even this year, mm -hmm. working together is happening a lot. And you just start to forge these relationships. It's not like there's a pressure on it. But man, when you just live in that same space, especially for a freshman to just appreciate these new friends 
And there's a few God I think's handpicked that just become friends for life. And when you're in college, you don't necessarily know mm. they're going to be friends for life. You're like, right. these are my college friends. But it's a little bit different than high school. You, you start to forge those friendships in a way that bond you around the things of God, around mutual purpose in life, around what he's calling you towards. They sharpen you. They start to press into your edges because you're mm. living in such close community. So you, you have to kind of face some of the challenges that you have in your character and integrity. Yeah. All those things were so formative to me yeah. during these years. Sure. So to take us a look back further back into your liberty years. Uh, how are they formative for you? Because I know they that even our founder and so much of your experience here as a college yeah. student was a part of you beginning Q yeah. comments, Q conversations, Q. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? Again, going even back into middle school, high school, I would sit at church and take notes. I mean, I, I love taking notes. Jerry Falwell Sr. would always be talking about the culture. Mm. I mean, he cared a lot about the culture. He had a deep theological understanding. I think he was very influenced by Francis Schaeffer, who was right. somebody who was in Europe, um, but a conservative leader who really understood this uh, integration of our faith into cultural life. And so when he would speak, I, would, I just remember writing down all kinds of things that related to the Christian's role to engage the culture. Now, I, you know, I think liberty at that time, and it was right at the beginning of the, you know, this is the 80s, 90s, a lot of that energy was going towards politics. Mm. So I heard a lot about political engagement. But I think what God was doing in me was laying this foundation theologically that the Christian should care about every single thing in culture. And so for me, it started to expand. Yeah. And I started to realize Christians are called into every area of culture, media, arts and entertainment, the business world as entrepreneurs, education systems, mm. social sector, social entrepreneurs, every kind of current issue you could imagine. We should be there answering those questions better than people who don't know Christ. Yeah. That foundation was laid from that. And then the other thing that I think um, I, I received and I still receive inspiration from today mm. is Jerry Falwell Sr.'s vision. I mean, we're sitting here today on a campus that at the time was literally like a hill. And I know everybody yeah. hears those stories, but I was kind of born four years into that deal. And so I just kind of watched it slowly happen to where we used to have like Treasure Island was, yeah. and I'd go to camp over there and that's where the school was and it slowly moved here. And so the You've vision seen it come into fruition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you hear this vision and then you see it happening and you realize, man, God gives vision to some people. And without that vision, truly, this doesn't happen. And so that's inspired me to, to grow my vision and not just think small, but to think big and know that God comes into that and we get on board with what he's doing and he can take it so much further than even Jerry Falwell Sr. maybe thought he would ever see one day. And, and God just continues to advance this. So it, it's a yeah. very inspiring thing. So engaging culture with our faith, yeah. not just engaging culture, but right. engaging culture with the Bible in one hand, a newspaper in another, yeah. right? And just coming in uh, ready to, what, what was the inspiration behind Q Conversations? Yeah, so we began Q, which the Q stands for questions. We wanted to create a space where leaders uh, that were Christians, but maybe leading churches, maybe they're leading organizations or humanitarian work, or they're leading companies would feel like they could ask bigger questions and not just be told what to think, but they would actually learn how to think, how to mm. critically think about the issues coming at us. Because as we all know, every year there's new issues, there's new conversations, there's new social issues, current issues, news topics. Right. There's things we're faced with and our culture's faced with them too. But we as Christians come into that, as you said, like scripture becomes our grounding force. Like without scripture, we don't know what's true. Right. I mean, it it's, can almost sound oversimplistic, but literally the scriptures is what's going to ground us. It's going to convict us to know how to see through an issue. Um, but we also have to read the world. Like we read yeah. the word, we read the world. We, we try to assess the context, understand what is our world thinking and why? And how did they get there? And what are the bad ideas that may be leading them astray? Because we know the enemy wants to deceive. He wants to distort. Right. He wants to take God's truth and just change it a little bit yeah. to pull us off track. So by being in the word, we start to see that clearly. And so that then starts to give us confidence, I think, to address and move into every part of the world. Like instead of being offended, we need to be provoked. So, mm. so we don't get offended by the bad things we see happening around us, the darkness around us the ideas that are influencing the friends we love, the music that maybe we hear or the entertainment that we see that is challenging. We're not offended by that. We, we know the world's just operating the way it operates. Like that's just the way darkness starts to go. Right. But we walk into that and go, we're gonna create better culture. We're not just gonna respond and condemn and critique. 
mm. that culture. We want to create something better. We're going to create new films. We're going to create new documentaries. We're going to create new books. That's part of where Q Media has gone, right. is starting to create and curate the kind of content and thinking that actually starts to inspire Christians to realize God's called us into all these areas. Yeah. And, and that's become very motivating. So engage culture biblically, obviously, but then also be a part of the solution. Don't just critique culture, no. but actually create culture. That's right. Take us a little further into that. Well, like, yeah. So if a student is watching and they're not a uh, filmmaker, they're not a actor, yeah. they're, just a, they're an aviation you know, yeah, yeah. or they're nursing. Sure. How do they create culture? So, well, Andy Crouch writes about this. He's an author who wrote a book called Culture Making, and he talks a lot about this idea of creating culture. I'll say for Rebecca and I, I mean, in our life, 19 years ago, our son was born with Down syndrome, yeah. Cade. You know Cade. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. We now have, you know, we have four children, and our youngest is seven and has Down syndrome. We adopted right. her last year. So we love these children with Down syndrome. Can I just pause and say, yes. growing up with that in my own family with Benjamin, there is such a void. There's just... Uh, yeah. There's a void in uh, places where people with Down syndrome, you know, can belong. There's a void in places where families can go get answers. There's a, yeah. There just seems to be so much yeah. missing in that conversation. So. Yeah, and I'm so sorry about Benji's loss. Yeah. We, love, we love Benji, man. Thanks, man. An incredible man that yeah. inspired us, you know, the times we were you. with him. Gosh. Yeah. And, and that's what's beautiful about these souls yeah. is they're beautiful children. They're For beautiful sure. adults. They bring so much to our communities. Well, when he was born, this well, was God 19 years ago. Yeah, he gives us Cade. I realized nine out of 10 of these children are aborted mm. when the mother and father find out in utero that their child may have Down syndrome. Right. Nine out of 10. I thought that was a made up like pro-life like statistic. And then I started researching and realized New York Times is reporting this like, this is well known. 90%. They're trying to eliminate yeah. these little kids from our world. So I realized Cade was like a survivor. Mm. But we realized the reason that was happening wasn't, wasn't always just ill intent. It was that a lot of moms and dads didn't understand Down syndrome. Such a void. Of, they would Google yeah. it and they would find that, hey, this is actually, you know, they were told WebMD, whatever, this is going to be really bad for you. This is not going to be good for the siblings. So a group of us get together and decide, let's create culture. Let's not just mm. condemn or critique the problem here. And so what we did is we created this book called Understanding a Down Syndrome Diagnosis took beautiful pictures of these little babies, toddlers, eight-year-olds riding skateboards, 15-year-olds doing ballet, 20-year-olds working in doctor's offices, all with Down syndrome. And we told the full story. Hey, yes, there's some challenges here. They're delayed in certain You're areas. Honest. I've read that book. You're not just painting a, a picture yeah. of hope. You're actually being very realistic about the challenges as well. Yes, yeah. but we also said these are beautiful souls that mm -hmm. add so much to our families and to our life. Um, we also created a guide for doctors who were delivering the diagnosis to parents because we realized through our research, part of the challenge was it was always delivered with, hey, I'm really sorry to tell you this horrible news, basically, that your child's going to have Down syndrome. So it immediately started the conversation in a way that put the parents on a defensive you could just tell the insurance companies, everything was kind of leveraged against this child coming into the world. So we delivered this, we were in Atlanta at the time, to every OBGYN office, geneticist, and said, will you give these away to parents that find out this news? And we weren't sure how we'd be met with that. They actually said, yes, please, we've never had anything like this. And this yeah. is actually really beautiful than just the little printout that we've been giving to people. And one of the couples that helped do that with us decided to turn that into a nonprofit. It mm. still exists today. Wow. This book has become the book that's recommended by the OBGYN Association of America to say we want every office to have this. Right. And what that's done is, I believe, saved countless children's lives. But the, the idea here is it was creating something. Like it was missing in the culture. Yeah. And we just created it and we delivered it and we were kind about it and it became something that again starts to change the culture. So that's what I mean by creating culture. It's not, it doesn't mean you have to go, you know, fund high art museums. I mean, it, it, it right. means create things, create yeah. organizations, books, talks, yeah. these kind of conversations. This is creating and putting something out there right. that now the world has to tangibly deal with. And that's, that's what we as Christians ought to be doing more of. Yeah. And so take us to the uh, three values of Q. Uh, yeah. The first time I was introduced to Q, I, I, was, um, I was introduced to this lens of these three different values. Yeah. Um, you actually gave me an opportunity to come and, and do a, do a nine-minute talk. And you mm -hmm. said, hey, look through these values and like attach to them, filter through them yeah. like, you, as you share your story. And I, I thought they were beyond... They were, they were so good. I've applied a lot of these principles to my own life and this yeah. way I look at things. But take us to the first one, uh, staying curious. Yeah, so stay curious. And as you mentioned, Q, I mean, part of Q for 15 years, we've 
basically brought together leaders to do nine minute talks right. and 18 minute talks. So we forced leaders to give us the best they've got. Why, why that length? Well, like a TED talk, like yeah, a shorter. Time and attention span. It also focuses presenters to really consolidate what they have to say. It's hard, man. It is hard, yeah. right? Uh, I mean, a lot of our presenters are used to a lot more time and, and you see it just focus them. Mm -hmm. And so then, and then for the end users, we all get the benefit of like really good thinking, really sharp, but succinct. Right. Um, but the first value is stay curious. So the three are stay curious, think well, advance good. But stay curious. I mean, for Christians, we should be the most curious people in this world. We shouldn't just box out information we don't like. We should be running towards it to better understand it. I mean, science obviously helps us understand the way God designed this world. So yeah. we love science. We don't push away from science. We're like, God, let's look into the science of this because it's gonna actually reveal to us more about God. I think of Proverbs 25 two, where it says, it's to the glory of God to conceal a thing. Mm. It's to the glory of kings to seek it out. That's right. Right? Yeah. We should be searching out truth wherever we can find it. Yeah. And as we do that, as we're curious, it actually gives us this posture towards the world that again is one of being provoked, which I think is something we as Christians, that's something we should build into our life is a, a being provoked because by being curious, you're asking just better questions. And we should be asking really good questions, not just assuming everybody thinks this or that, but let's ask them for themselves. And so curiosity starts to stoke that. It's, yeah. an, it's a welcoming, posture. I've learned for me, curiosity uh, draws out an awe towards God. Yeah. You know, when I, when I have a holy curiosity yeah. to like want to go, how did, how did God make that? Right. Or how is that an opportunity mm -hmm. right now in front of me? Because it doesn't feel like one. Or how, right. when I'm curious and I'm leaning in, I have, a, I have the posture of a student yeah. You know, and especially Teachable. guys like you who are always teaching. They're always clipping a mic on you going, teach, Gabe. You teach out of a place where you've, you've always been a student and you've been curious. Yeah. And you're like, I'm calling to the Lord to help me understand this better. Right. And the children of God ought to be the most curious because we're not afraid to, to see what's under the rock. Right. That's right. But I think there was a season. I know when I was growing up, there, there was a sense like apologetics, for example. Right. The posture in that can be one of defense. It's the case for Christ, right? right. It's, it's like a, you're in a court and you're trying to persuade people by winning the argument. But if yeah. you win the argument but people don't like you, you <laughs> maybe didn't win the argument. Yeah, you won and the so, point but not the person. Yeah, yeah. so this, this, this curiosity posture, I think, invites people into conversation and you're not fearful of what you're gonna find out. Even if you disagree with what you hear or you believe what you're hearing doesn't yeah. align with the truth, your curiosity allows you to at least listen so yeah. that you now have something to offer to the conversation. Our buddy, Brad Lominick, I think says yeah. it so great. He says, you know, when you're in a conversation with someone, work really hard to be interested mm -hmm. instead of interesting, <laughs> yeah, you know? So good. like, if you're on a date, by the way, like this weekend, work really hard on this date to be interested instead yeah. of working really hard to be interesting. You're probably gonna get to a, a second date because you were interested right. more than you were like trying to be so hard like on, I'm like, don't you know all these interesting things about me? And I think again, being interested is, is a way for you to foster, mm. you know, an environment where people are more open to yep. talk yep. And, and open to have, and it's, it's honestly, it's a bridge to the gospel, you know, for and, so many And I feel like at Liberty, that's what I see happen here so much. Yeah. And I've seen you do it. Like yeah. you, you sit with guests that maybe you don't fully agree with, every single thing they think, or if you were to line up your theology, you'd be like, you know, I don't right. support that. But the curiosity allows us all to learn. It allows us into their worldview, allows yeah. us to even see the flaws for ourselves, without you saying, hey, here's what that person thinks. You know, Tim Keller says, that the best way to have a conversation with somebody you disagree with is make sure the person you disagree with is able to present their best arguments. Don't wow. just create straw men arguments and say, yeah. hey, here's what they think. No, let's listen to them. Let's yeah. not be afraid of that. And I've seen that in the culture here. There's not a fear of hearing ideas that maybe you disagree with personally, but in fact are going to benefit all of us because yeah. they're the conversations we all are having to have every day with our okay. friends, back home, texting, communicating, however we're talking with people. Like this is the real world. We're going to have to talk about these issues. Right. So learning this posture, I think, becomes critical for a Christian to be prepared to enter the world. Right. Uh, here's what I've learned. I can, I can hold to my convictions and not compromise on what I believe, but at the same time come in seeking to understand someone instead of just seeking first to un be understood. Yeah. And typically, even though we will walk away completely in disagreement, we've built a relationship. Right. Because that person listened to me, I listened to them. I have two ears one and one mouth for a reason. Yeah. 
listen twice as hard as I you know speak. Right. right. Um, but take us to the next value. Yeah, uh, so, thinking well. So thinking well. I mean, this this gets to the core of how Christians, I believe, ought to engage these difficult topics we're talking about and these yeah. issues. We have to think well. We have to you know you think of Romans 12, 1 and two. But the idea that don't be conformed to this world. But transformed, right, to re by renewing your mind so that you actually right. think the way that God wants you to think, so that you understand His will because you're thinking correctly. You see, in our culture today, I mean, part of the, the, the reason truth is losing out and truth has become a word that doesn't mean a lot anymore is because people are starting to determine what is right or true based on how they feel. Mm. There's, there's actually a term for this. It's called emotivism. Um, and it's the idea that I know what's right and wrong based on what I feel. Okay? Not based on objective fact, not based on reason or logic. For Christians, though, reason and logic have always been part of the equation. Like, we don't shy away from, like, logically working through something. We see in Romans 1 that all of us have this opportunity to understand God because we can see it in His creation, right? right? That's because we can reason. We can see the beauty of a tree or the beauty of seasons, or we can see the cycle of seed time and harvest, and, and we start to see these principles that God's baked into this universe and into the human life that reveals truth. And so thinking well requires us to think about things. Again, not to just make these quick, simple judgments, because we lose credibility with the world when we don't think well about something, yeah. when we just kind of throw out these platitudes, but they're not relating to the question someone's asking. Mm -hmm. And I think I've seen that happen a lot in these last, you know, last decade, I would say. There's so many different current issues that are coming. I mean, every day there's like a new one that we have to engage. And, and again, when we're provoked, we're able to actually sit at the table with people and try to understand a complex issue and not just give simple answers. Yeah. And I think for a long time we've, we've been comfortable and, and I love this next generation. They're not content to just give simple answers, pat answers to, to serious issues people are dealing with. They wanna, you know, my wife, we, we talk a lot about mental health because her journey has mm -hmm. been one of walking through panic attacks right. and anxiety. Um, but mental health is such a huge and complex issue. We don't just throw a simple answer at that. Right. We don't just say, hey, if you pray, that will change. No, we get into the complexity of how the brain is working and, and the neurons and how they're firing and what's bringing that on and how do we work through past trauma to start mm -hmm. to reveal and understand. Those are the types of things I mean. When we think yeah. well as Christians, we actually do value and service to our neighbors yeah. because we're, we're actually honoring the image of God in them and we're also, we're also honoring the complexity of the world God created. So, Gabe, obviously, thinking well is thinking biblically. That's right. It has to begin with that as a has foundation. To. That's right? right. So the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It right. cuts through bone and marrow and judges the attitudes of life. And so the word of God is first and foremost in thinking well, but then mental health, for example. It's not just prescribing Bible verses to someone, but you have to then in thinking well, go beyond just knowing a scripture passage, but knowing about the very topic that- That's right that yeah. you're engaging people with. That's right. So what, what do medical you know, leaders say about mental health? What, That's right. what does a psychologist say about the trauma and distress of this pandemic season on the life of an average 19 year old coming in here? Yeah. So. Yeah. And then we also, like you said, we go to scripture to know we can cast our burdens and anxieties on Christ. He will right. carry them for us. There's, there's rhythms that we need to be living into that God designed. And, and Rebecca writes a lot about this, the idea of yeah. rest and Sabbath, right? Yeah. God's built in Sabbath so that we take a break from our technology, from our work, from our productivity one day a week at least. And when yeah. we do that, again, we're getting back into this rhythm that God's created. But to avoid the conversation around science or medicine, and just give the verse does a disservice to the conversation. It feels, I think sometimes to people that, that aren't thinking well, that they think medical uh, information or science contradicts scripture when it actually doesn't. Correct. The creator is the creator of, of, That's right. of medicine, the creator of science. And so we think well when we think biblically through all of those things, right? Yeah, one of the greatest lies is that science is somehow distant from Christianity. And nothing yeah. can be further from the truth. Students here who are studying in biology or science or chemistry, right. you just, the more you get into science, I mean, I think of Francis Collins who heads NIH, who right. discovered the human genome, right? And he's written a book called The Language of God because he understands that the more I get into science, 
the more I see the fingerprints That's of right. God. It's completely unavoidable. Yeah. And so don't believe that lie. You're going to hear that a lot as you move into this culture that somehow as a Christian, you're anti-science. That it, Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, right. Christians are the ones who really develop the scientific method. So it comes out of a Christian faith to say, mm -hmm. we want to observe what God's done so we can understand how things work. And that's the basis for our faith. And then advance good, our third value? Yeah, advance good. I mean, that, that's simple, right? We all want to be a part of doing good things. But I think biblically we are called, Hebrews 10, 23, and 24 talks about not wavering, not being the type of Christian who wavers and gets tossed in the wind. But verse 24 says, spur one another on to good works. Yeah. We see throughout the New Testament, good works have been laid out before you. We're supposed to go do good works. God's looking at our works. Our salvation's not based on our works. Our salvation's based on grace alone. But once we come into relationship with Christ, our purpose in this world has to do a lot with what we do, not just yeah. what we say. Our actions will be judged. We see in Revelation, like we will be judged on our deeds, what we do as well. So we don't just get a pass and go, hey, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. And, and that's it. And we don't have a responsibility on this earth. And I think that's what I've seen in the last couple of decades that has been so encouraging is Christians really adopting a holistic view, which goes back to historic Christianity. Historically, Christians understood this. I mean, you think about Augustine in the city of God. You think about, you know, even the last 500 years of the Protestant Reformation. There was a thoughtfulness that went into saying, hey, we're part of building these societies to, yeah. to glorify God and to honor God. We don't get a pass on that. And so advancing good has to do with doing good, but it, it's not that you're doing good absent of scripture or absent of telling people what's motivating that good. Mm -hmm. I love it when I'm doing good alongside somebody and the conversations start to right. erupt and they actually happen more often when you're doing good. Yeah. And, and people wanna know, why are you motivated to do this? Why are you volunteering today? Why are you serving? Why are you giving your money to this particular cause? And you have the opportunity to explain to people, I'm doing this because I wanna glorify God, because right. God's called me to be a part you know, the ministry of reconciliation that we're all yeah. called to, that, that we're to put things back together in the world that are broken and they are acting in a way that they ought not act. And he's called us, and this is back to creating culture, mm -hmm. like, like the little book on Down syndrome. Something's broken there. Yeah. We're called to reconcile that. How do we restore that? And for us creatively, to restore it was to create a book, create a system, get it into to doctor's right. offices. And that's part of what it means to advance good as well. Man, here at Liberty, did you have CSER? Did you guys do No, services? but what goodness, I've been so familiar with how that's been yeah. growing. And you guys are, I mean, I feel like, again, embodying that at Liberty. Yeah, I think some of, some of that mantra from you guys, just of doing well, you know, uh, uh, is a, a big part of our DNA here. Yeah. Uh, CSER, uh, our students are watching, they know, like, they, it, it is a, um, it's beyond an obligation. It is an obligation when you're a student here. It's front-loaded into an agreement, contract with a student who comes here. But I think... A lot of them come in maybe thinking, I've got to do this. But once they get into it, they realize I get to do this yeah. because it really is a good Samaritan opportunity, whether they're doing after school tutoring or whether they're the Humane Society or whether they're just they're just showing up and helping someone, uh, you know, yeah. in a broken down community, yeah. make that place beautiful again. Yeah. What they're doing is they're doing good, but it's it has a bigger bigger you know, agenda in mind than just doing the good work. It's right. more than just social work, it's gospel work. It, yeah. we, we say it's um, meeting a temporary need to connect people with eternal truth. Yeah. Because the end play is for us to be able to eventually prayerfully make eye contact with someone, like you said, who goes, now why did you show up? Why do <laughs> right. you care? You know, and so someone's hungry and we feed them hoping that they'll say, why do you care? We can go because Jesus is the bread of life. Yeah. So how do we get into gospel conversations? Yeah. And we don't want to force it. We don't want to front load the first day the, you know, a nine year old is sitting there in a big brother program. <laughs> and the very first day we're like, right. let me share the gospel, you know, the Roman road with you. But instead yeah. it's like, how do I build this relationship with this young man? Yeah. How do I show up in his life and be a consistent, you know, example to him? be a good friend, be a big yeah. brother, and then eventually talk about how we can be brother and sister in eternity. Right. You know, how do, we, how do we find an orphan and meet a need so that through adoption, God can like give you that opportunity to step into the life of someone and say, ultimately, the ultimate game is eternal adoption in the kingdom of God. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I think sometimes, you know, it can get, for, for people, there can be this hang up of, should I do good? Is, am I, am I, if I don't witness to somebody in the act of doing good, am I somehow not glorifying God in that? And I would, yeah. I would personally say, let's remove a little bit of that pressure and understand God's glorified in the good work. 
Mm. He's glorified when you help your neighbor, yeah. right? When you love the person near you. And, and we also understand the Holy Spirit's the one that's gonna nurture that. You could be planting the seed, you could be watering the seed, right. you could be harvesting. And you, and you never know what role God's planned for you in that. But I think some Christians have used it also as an excuse not to do evangelism. And we certainly don't want to do that. We need mm. to be bold and courageous to tell people the truth. Yeah. Now, you're gonna have a better opportunity in this cultural climate to tell people the truth when you're in relationship with them, mm -hmm. when they know you love them, when yeah. you're in their story, when you care about them. And usually evangelism, John Tyson says this, like evangelism happens a couple, there's a couple key moments evangelism tends to be more pertinent. Tim Keller says this as well. It's during some sort of global crisis, okay? Right. So this moment, very ripe. People are asking big questions. What's life about? How do I find meaning? What just happened? What's wrong with this world? How are we gonna fix it? These yeah. are gospel questions every human asks. And the second one's when somebody goes through a personal crisis. Yeah. So they're dealing with a mental health issue. They've lost a parent. They've, they have a broken relationship. Right. Those are our moments. And so we build the relationships, but we do evangelism. I was on, you know, I was on Instagram direct message with one of my neighbors in New York who we often talked about. He's an atheist. Yeah. But Rebecca came out and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, man, I'm witnessing to, to Clive right now. Like we're in, we're in a conversation about what God has to say to him. Now right. he's an atheist. I don't back away from the conversation because I know he's going through a lot of pain right now. He's lost his job. He lives in New York City. Things are falling apart. So I want him to know, like, it's not up to you, brother. You, you don't have to make all this happen. Living a surrendered life into what Christ has called you to is actually the answer and the way out for all that you're dealing with. So, so we're bold with that. We don't back away from it, right. but we do good. Yeah. And that helps us build relationships that we might not otherwise have. You know, just to brag on our students again, that it's such a gift to be able to year after year after year, be able to have a partner in the city uh, that we sent volunteers to because yep. it is long play. So sometimes we will see a student lead someone to Christ because year after year after year, someone showed up before them, then someone else showed up and then that person graduated, got their camping on, but then someone else showed up yeah. and someone else showed up and, and we just continue to move the ball forward. Yeah. And then maybe a personal crisis happened, maybe a pandemic happened, or maybe just the consistency of believers showing up. Yeah. People that were Christians that were Christ-like eventually got us to a tipping point mm. where that person just said, you know what, I'm, I'm finally taking your faith seriously because you're just the one guy who continues to show up for me every yeah. year. You know? So it's just such a testament, I think, of the, of the power of just doing good. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, uh, I know you have worked quite a bit as well in just as a curious student, learning from stats and learning from culture, yeah. our reputation sometimes as the church, you know, I know yeah. you, you come from with a, you love the, the, the church, yeah. but at the same time, you're honest about sometimes the reputation we have to be extremists or mm -hmm. to be irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, can you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the, the latest research, David Kinnaman, the president of Barna, we've yeah. collaborated on a couple of books. The right. latest one we did, I mean, it was kind of shocking to see how Americans were feeling about faith and culture. 46% of Americans believe that religion is part of the problem in our world. And, and you Not know, we might solution. agree and go, hey, religion, Jesus wasn't for religion, but 42% said people of faith are part of the problem. So when a culture is starting to turn on faith and religion and seeing religion as contributing to the problems, not contributing to the solutions, you're, you're seeing a dynamic shift yeah. that's big time that we've not experienced in American life. And so as the church, what is our opportunity in that? Our opportunity is to be the church. It's some of what we were just talking about. It's to be in our communities, not just telling people everything that's wrong with them, but also inviting them into these communities and, and helping them find truth in it. And so the church in a moment where it's seen as irrelevant, we can only go up from here. I mean, in my opinion, hmm. most people in, in the younger generations are seeing the church as institutionally irrelevant to them. You know, we know one out of three in this 18 to 25 year old range is saying, I don't want to observe any religion. I, I don't care about wow. faith and I'm not gonna align with Christianity or Judaism or, or anything. Um, there's an opportunity because you know what they're also saying, and, and we know this, the mental health statistics, suicide uh, consideration in the last six months has gone up. 25% of 18 to 24 year olds have considered suicide, okay? That's one out of four of, of college student aged people, wow. which means they're asking the biggest question ever. What is my purpose? Is there any meaning? Is there any reason that I'm here? Am I just kind of a blob that exists with no purpose? And we as the church come into that conversation and say, no, God has an incredible 
designed for your life. You're made in his image. You are valuable. No matter what this world's throwing at you, you have a purpose to fulfill. And the Christian story actually helps them live into that right. in community, which is the church. And so I think the church has incredible opportunities when we're perceived so negatively. We shouldn't dog on the church. God's using the church and he's reshaping the church even in this moment, this last year. He's reshaping the church. It may, the numbers may go down a bit, but that's okay. There's a strength forming. There's a conviction forming. There's a basis forming. I think of Revelation 2 and 3 where Christ is talking to the churches. You know, he says, repent and return. Come on. You, know, you know, two weeks ago, we had a thousand churches all over this country mm -hmm. repenting and, and pastors unifying and saying, we're going to do repentance. Yeah. I know students were up at, in D.C. doing the same thing, right? right? God, God's doing something here that's about repenting of where we've gone off track. We've made the church about ourselves. We've made it about entertainment. We've, we've just gotten away from some of the basics that I think Christ tells the church to be. And now he's saying, like he says to the church of Ephesus, return. I want you to return. I love you, but return. And when you return, the amazing things that I'm about to do through you. So I, I think like the year ahead, while some look ahead and they're like, man, I don't, 2020, where's this all going? Is it going to get worse? Man, there's a hopefulness. Mm -hmm. You read Revelation, you realize we can have a hope in a future that we can't see yet. Yeah. but that God's got this. And part of our role is to trust him, to be faithful, to not let the chaos pull us off track from, from what he's called us to do and the people around us, the things we do have a sense of control over, the family we're in, the community we're in, the dorm we're in, the community group I'm in. I'm gonna be a light in that. I'm gonna encourage people and we're gonna be people of hope that walk into this darkness and people are gonna see the light through that. I mean, you're so right. People are asking these dire questions, but they're driving by the church building and they're seeing that as a part of the problem and not a part of the solution yeah. sometimes. And so we, we have to have a posture of repentance in where we got it wrong. Yeah. But yet at the same time, we're God's plan A and there is no plan B. The, the, right. the local church is God's plan A. The, we're the bride. Yeah. And I, as even as you were talking, I was thinking like, we're the bride with, with combat boots on. You know, like we ought to be out there serving. Not again, waging war against the lost. The mm -hmm. lost aren't the enemy. The yeah. lost are the prize. Yeah. You know, and so how do we then wage a war in being a part of the solution yeah. of all the things that are, that are broken in the world and so that we can sh point the gospel. A couple of words I hear you use a lot. Just yeah. uh, you and I have a, a friendship outside of just these yeah. kind of contexts as well. Um, I wrote down it's compassion, conviction, clarity, confidence. Every time I'm around you, you're always talking about clarity and confidence and compassion yeah. and conviction. Um, you know, uh, Talk to us about engaging in those kind of ways, those yeah. kind of postures. Well, I think some of what we talked about earlier, you know, your conviction is based on your understanding of truth and scripture. When right. you know God has said something, and this is true for my life, it'll be true for the next generation, it'll be true for the next generation. All of a sudden, that conviction then breeds confidence. So our confidence doesn't come from bravado, like we're just louder and we're gonna say it better. Our confidence comes from conviction in Christ because our confidence is in Christ. So being in the word is so essential. And I know that can, again, growing up in the church as I did here, you just hear that every day and it kind of becomes passe. But no, in this moment, I've seen a hunger for God's word start to grow. I mean, I have a, a, a men's group that, that meets every Tuesday morning and we're in scripture, 25 men, and many of them weren't in a Bible study but they've come together because they're like, I wanna know what God's word says about this. Yeah. Cause in all this confusion and distraction, I get clarity. And so when we have that conviction and confidence, it starts to give us a clarity on how to engage the world, but we don't engage the world with judgment or self-righteousness. There's a compassion, mm -hmm. like, like true love is compassion, but, but you know, love as our culture talks about it is, is affirming everything anybody wants to do, right. never challenging them, never saying, hey, I think you're on a path that's gonna lead towards destruction. Um, you're not allowed to do that in this culture because that word's been redefined. But, but what we know is love biblically lays down its life for a friend. Love, love actually uh, is, 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 a, is compassion with standards, okay? There is a standard. And so as Christians, we gotta know the standard. Otherwise we do get tossed as Hebrews 10, 23 says. We, we start to waver because we don't have the confidence that this is true not only from generations ago, but it's gonna be true generations later. And I wanna be on the right side of history. And the right side of history is actually understanding what God says about these things. Do you think it's connected to the idea that a lot of times Christians lack the confidence they need to walk into tough conversations because they have a lot of emotion in mind, sure. but they don't have a lot of scripture in mind. They have not hidden God's word yeah. in their heart. Sure. So they're walking into a circumstance and they don't really know what God teaches on that. Yeah. So they're kind of trying to come out of their 
emotional authority mm -hmm. or out of the latest Christian song they learned authority, yeah. which might even be biblical, but it's, yeah. uh, they know a lot of emotion, not a lot of devotion. And, that, and that's, that's the spirit of the age right now, yeah. is, is this emotion driven thinking, emotion driven finding truth. Yeah. Like emotion is everything. And so you start to see it show up everywhere. I mean, whatever I feel about a situation, I think is true. And, and you even get to the point where our conversations are, well, what is your truth? This is my truth, this is your truth. No, we, we know as Christians, truth exists outside of ourselves. It's subjective. It's not something I get to decide whether it's true or not, right. or if it's my truth. No, it's true. And how I'm gonna relate to that is gonna be based on how much I'm willing to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And so I think the emotion, what we need to be careful about is what you said, is just responding to issues with compassion, which we should do. So we should show empathy. We have to be empathetic. We have to not look at the person who's struggling with something and, and blame them as a person. Mm. Many times it's just a bad idea. What we wanna get angry at is not the person, it's the idea. Yeah. It's the idea, it's the deceiver, it's the person who's come in, the enemy, to distort truth. With that compassion and relationship, we can help lead people back to what is true. And, and I believe God and the Holy Spirit works with us in that. And yeah. that, that He's designed our human hearts to actually, when we bump into truth, we know we just bump into truth. Yeah. We might not have even been looking for it, but when somebody lays it out there for you, you're like, you know, I don't like hearing this, but this is true. That it's such a vital part of, honestly, Q. Yeah. You know, Q is not afraid to have the tough conversations with compassion and conviction. You don't have to drop, you don't have to drop one to pick up the other, yeah. you know? Um, but talk to us about all of these things that are tough conversations. I mean, it can yeah. become overwhelming, yeah. honestly, especially these days, it feels like every time you turn on, you know, your phone or every mm -hmm. time you turn on the t television, it just feels like, especially during this year, more things are going wrong sometimes than yeah. things that are going right. Yeah. At least that's what's yelling at you all caps yes. when you turn on the television. And so uh, talk to us about hope in the midst of all this despair. Yeah. Well, these issues, it, it does feel like things are accelerating and there's more information and, and issues. And we, we really are in this competition for information and yeah. what's true and what's not true. But then there's also these real issues that are some are very personal for us. Some are very distant. And mm -hmm. I don't know that our... I don't know that we were designed as humans to have to take on the weight of all that. I think that's a challenge in our mental health space right now is we feel like we have to take on the weight of the world and, and we weren't, I don't believe, designed to do that. I believe Christ can take on the weight of the world, but you and me, looking through a Twitter feed or reading the news or keeping up with current events, it's, it's a lot. And so I think God calls us to engage the things closest to us, the things we really can have an impact on, mm. not to feel like we have to be experts in every single thing. But as you start to define your calling, especially as a college student, as you start to really see your calling and what is it that God's put on your heart, what are the talents he's given you, what are the burdens that you burden with, they keep you up at night, those start to point you towards a direction where you actually start to see truth and you start to see how God's calling you into something that you can become an expert and you can think well about it. You can be the person who's gonna create new culture in that space. And so instead of trying to understand all the issues, it, it's to really narrow in on the things God's calling you into and the things he's burdening you about. I will say with Q, part of our role and part of what we do, we feel um, we have an opportunity to educate a lot of Christian leaders in a lot of different spaces. So yeah. we actually delve into a bunch of the topics. So when we do a particular, you know, a typical Q event, we'll have up to 40 talks on a variety of topics dealing with medicine and science to mental health, to theology, to, uh, you know, 100%. anything we could be talking about. We could talk about, you know, civil unrest. Next month we'll have an event called Q&A in Nashville and pastors and leaders will come to that event and we'll be very social distanced, right. but we're like, we're gonna still get together because we gotta talk about some of this stuff. We're gonna talk about civil unrest and elections the week after the election. We're gonna talk about you know, this distinction between biblical convictions and government restrictions and how churches are, are forced with you know, trying to make a decision about their conviction. Are we gonna right. gather or not gather? Um, we're gonna be discussing censorship and some of those ideas. We're gonna talk about Generation Z, these, these students, and what is the hope that we're all seeing in this generation? I mean, as I talk to leaders, we're fired up about the next generation. Yeah. They're not as wavering as I think Absolutely. previous generations. They're, they understand something bigger is going on and they don't wanna just be a pendulum swinging. They actually are like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna actually rest on scripture we see truth more clearly because of all the chaos and the fog. 
and we're going to go after it. So we want to talk about how do we nurture that? How do we do discipleship? What does prayer and revival look like? So John Mark Comer, you know, John Matt Tyson, Chandler. Jenny yeah. Allen, David Bailey, Micah Edmondson. There's so many that are going to come together to be a part of those conversations. And that, that's one of my favorite things. Like that, what you just said, wasn't on the schedule with Q. You yeah. know, I always find it so interesting that you guys set the template, but then you see, you wait and see what's happening. For example, um, Andy Stanley was one of our convoc yeah. convocation guests uh, earlier this season. And we talked in that conversation about how he had decided as his church, you know, in Atlanta to not even open their week to week regular services yeah. the way that they normally do it until January. Um, and you actually connected us with Andy for that conversation. Well, what was interesting was you had Andy on for that, but then you also had as a juxtaposition of that, John MacArthur, yeah. who is in a state where they're saying it's illegal to do this and he's willing to go to jail and they're meeting every week, breaking the law. Right. And so being citizens of heaven, being good citizens of earth, upside down kingdom, all right. of those things, all of that came about very quickly. Like you, yeah. you guys decided to foster that conversation yeah. and present it to this generation from a biblical lens. Yeah. Probably a couple of weeks out. Oh yeah, we, we quickly, are, we're trying to read what's happening in the world and we know Christians need to think well about it. And so yeah. we'll pull together these Q Media events and that particular one, it was called Church and State. We had right. 10 different nine minute talks on oh, yeah. that. So Andy was one, John MacArthur, we had Sam Rodriguez. Yeah. Um, we had constitutional attorneys, Oz Guinness, a historian. And we, so good. what we're trying to do is just present a holistic picture to a Christian to go, what does faithfulness look like on, in this moment on this particular issue? And that's just what God's called me into. And as we start, started at the beginning of this conversation, I feel like sitting in Lynchburg, Virginia, those early years, was part of stirring that vision that Christians must care about the culture. Now, how we go about it's a little different than maybe how Jerry Falwell Sr. worked on that through the moral majority or you know, through a political lens uh, nationally. But we care about that, we care about government, but yeah. we've added some other things into it so that the Christian can get a holistic view of how to lead in this moment. And so I'm pretty excited about this partnership. I mean, I, I wanted us to talk and I wanted them to hear some of your convictions as the leader of Q yeah. and Q Media and Q Commons. And, but uh, we partnered together to provide for our entire student body the subscription for yeah. one year to Q Media. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for yeah. this partnership with us. Um, talk to us about what's available. I mean, obviously, the conversations you just talked about and the sure. one that's coming up, all of this, you've built such a catalog of yeah. so much content uh, yeah. whether it's even Jackie Hill Perry, who was just That's our right. guest, as one of your guests. Yeah. And, um, so what's going to be afforded to a student who gets to take that code, gets on, yeah. and then just walks into a library yeah. of current conversations? Well, one of the challenges today is all of the content. I mean, as a student, obviously you're overwhelmed by content, information, textbooks, videos you're supposed to watch, you know, lecture series. What we've tried to do with Q is actually consolidate that and curate for you what we believe as a Christian leader are going to be some of the most helpful, important talks related to current issues. So when you go into the Q Media platform, you're first going to be met with a bunch of current issue playlists where we select and we constantly are rotating five or six talks that deal with some of these difficult current issues. So we'll talk about LGBT, we'll talk about sexuality, we'll talk about uh, uh, mental health, and, and you actually can go in and, and whatever you're faced with, whatever you're trying to consider, how does faith speak to that issue? I didn't even realize Christians were talking about that. Mm. You're gonna find it. If you're in the education realm and you're studying for education, or if you're working on a nursing degree, or if you're working in science, you're gonna find talks in there in a nine minute format that are gonna encourage and inspire you. There's also short films. We, we start, yeah. We've basically started to curate content for the thoughtful Christian that wants to you know, not be overwhelmed with too much content, but selected talks that we believe are gonna help you. And in addition to that, I know with community groups, I mean, we have so many community groups and especially college campuses that are doing this yeah. where they'll tee up one of those talks and it just creates a great way for the you know, community group to talk about an issue that might have been hard to bring up and maybe the leader doesn't feel like an expert in it. Mm. But by playing a nine minute talk by Jackie Hill Perry, for example, you can create an incredible conversation right. and hear where everybody's at. So that, that sort of thing will be afforded to everybody on this platform that they can access through their mobile device, laptop, Apple TV, you know, whatever. Yeah, man, thanks again. Uh, I think the way that we've um, kind of onboarded this thing is we just want our students to be able to text QCOM. Yep. So I know it's on the bottom third here as, the, as students are watching. QCOM, QCOM to 24502. That'll take them to the platform to sign up. 
and then again, uh, it's been paid for. Typically, a, a, a subscription that's that's yeah. you know not a hundred dollars a year. So. Yeah. But that's a, such a great partnership with you. Yeah. And I really think it's going to be fruitful because our students, like you said, this generation seems more not just interested and curious, but they want to be a part of the solution. Yeah. And they have a courage about them. Mm -hmm. Our students are not afraid to have those tough conversations. And they want to be able to have it biblically and um, have it well and have it with compassion. And so you're just giving us one more tool to be able to do that. Man, we love you. Thanks for all you're doing. Thank you. And uh, again, it's so great to have you and Rebecca as alumni. And yeah. we're hoping your son, Pierce, is going to come right. here. He's, he's a senior, so we're doing the college searches now, and, yeah. and we'd love for him to be at Liberty. We love this place. You bring all your kids here, all right? <laughs> all right. All right, we love you, buddy. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. So great to have Gabe Lyons with us again. Uh, make sure you utilize that code, access code that we gave you to go on Q Commons and see all that is afforded to you uh, for the remainder uh, of this year. Also want to remind you that we have a football game coming up at noon on Saturday. We're 3-0, and hoping to go 4-0 and against Louisiana Monroe. So let's support the team uh, into just, again, us getting ranked, nationally ranked, we're hoping uh, soon. Uh, last week was the first time that one of the coaches in the coaches poll actually put us on as a vote. And uh, we're excited about that. First time for us as a university uh, in our football program. But if we go 4-0, I've got a feeling we're going to get a lot more votes. And so Coach F Fries and the team are doing such a great job there. Uh, also, uh, campus community sign up for the William Stadium. The football stadium opens up Monday morning. Those get grabbed pretty quick. So just a reminder for you to set your calendar uh, for sign up for that. We love you. Hope you have a great weekend. See you soon.